My name is Jenny Klein, and I am interviewing today for the Illinois Veterans Project. Philip Wirtz, he was a special agent in Counterintelligence Corps, and he served from 1951 to 1953. Good morning, Phil. Um, we are continuing um, your interview that was conducted back at the end of uh, 2013. So um, if you would like to continue your story, um, you can begin wherever you wish. Okay, now... Um my memory doesn't serve me that well, Jenny, but I, can, I don't remember where we left off. It doesn't or... matter. You can continue talking and okay. just tell your stories. I see that you have a lot of notes in front of you, so um, if there's repetition, it's not, not a big deal. Okay. Okay, well, the, uh, my, what I might say is, going back, I, I started reflecting rather seriously about what my life was like at the, at the time that the Korean War started. I remember very well exactly where I was standing back in, in December 7th of 1941. And I was at a very impressionable age, 12 for example, and I had been following the war since the attack on Poland, and I remember so well the, uh, the capitulation of France at an early age when everyone thought that the French were going to be able to stop the Germans and the disappointment with that. And uh, then, of course, the Battle of Dunkirk where uh, we just about lost the British Army uh, as they were retreating to get back to the, uh, the islands of you know, Great Britain. And... It was very, very, I was conscious of all of that. And, and then when Korea happened, it was, again, one of those things that I just kind of glommed onto. And I was going to Nepal University at the time in the College of Commerce, and there were a number of veterans from World War II mm -hmm. who had gotten in the, uh, in the late stages of the war, and so they, uh, when they got out, they had the GI Bill available to them, and so many of them, there were ju just no jobs available at the end of World War II because of the, the time it took to convert back to a, um, a normal kind of basis of society with no more production of tanks and planes and the whole bit, cars and houses and everything were coming along and very few jobs for these veterans. So they would get in school and a lot of them, they would get enough money to uh, almost live. They were living at home with their parents no jobs, but the GI Bill was giving them about $500 a semester. And of course, at that time for a semester hour, you're only talking like eight, ten dollars an hour per semester hour. So it was, it was kind of a relaxing thing for them to do. And I got to know a lot of them quite well, and they were razzing me. They were saying, oh, <laughs> Phil, you're going, let me tell you, there's another war that we're going to be looking at. And so I said, well, whatever it is, it is, you know. So, uh, and uh, they gave me three little piece of advice, pieces of advice that I followed very religiously. Number one, they said, uh, never volunteer for anything. Everyone heard about that, and of course that was the case. You just didn't do it. If you're going to get picked, you're going to get picked, and you have to do it, uh, whatever it is that, that they suggest. So, secondly, they said, take all of the leave time you can whenever it's available. Said, well, why? You're going to get it anyway. He said, yeah, but if you're in combat and all of a sudden you're up in the front lines and the 
you guys are all catching hell. You know what? If you happen to get shot and killed, you're really going to be annoyed because you had all that lead time coming and you didn't take it. So I followed that advice. In the first 10 months, I had 42 days of leave time, you know, and so that was, that was kind of cool. But later on, it turned out to be bad because I didn't take any leave time at all. The last four months, I was working almost exclusively alone up in the British zone doing investigations. So, and the other thing, and this was really great, was they said, always make sure that you've got one of these portable can openers mm -hmm. because you never know where you, where you might be and you're not going to be able, up, able to open up a can with your bayonet, mm -hmm. but with a little opener, you know, in two different instances. Once when I was, we just took off to go over to Germany on the USS El Tinge, and of all days, it was, uh, oh, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th of, of 52. Um, for, some, for some reason, we, di we didn't get fed very well, and everyone was hungry, you know? Well, here we are, we get into the kitchen, and there we found big cans of pineapple and, uh, and peaches, you know? No one had anything to get into them, mm -hmm. you know? except Phil Wirtz. And I had my little can opener, and I opened them, and I was a, the hero for the trip, you know? <laughs> so that was cool. But, uh, so those were, those were a few pieces of advice. But <clears throat> a dear friend of mine had uh, been drafted about six months before I was, Don Petrowski from our neighborhood on the northwest side of Chicago. And Don Petrowski was one of these fellows, he had just gotten married, because I had gotten married too, but he, when he came home after basic training, he was so irritated with everything and he was not enjoying the time at all, you know. He blamed the service and all that for hearing he couldn't be with his new wife in the whole bit. And I, when he left, I said to my wife, I said, I tell you what, if I'm going, and I didn't know at that time, I had a deferment for my schooling. So I said, if I'm going, I am going to make the very best of it. I can. Look at Don. He, his personality had changed completely. He was a very miserable person, you know. So, anyway, that's a little bit farther down, but uh, when I did get drafted, I, <clears throat> and April 6th of 19, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 51, kind of the remnants of my um, pneumonia, mm -hmm. but uh, I knew they had me, you know, and I remember getting my uniform for the first time I put the uniform on. That was up at Fort Sheridan. Uh, I looked at myself and I said, well, they got me. <laughs> no kidding. Mm -hmm. From this point on, I'm in here. And I remembered the thought that I will make the best of it. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, my service, as I've mentioned to a, a bunch of people that I've talked about the experience, I said, you know, some guys are very lucky, you know, and is it attitude that will make the difference, or is it, uh, I think it's just the luck of the draw, quite frankly. And one thing that made me feel that very strongly is losing my very best buddy. When we were in basic training, uh, I ended up getting, uh, I scheduled first to go to uh, the, the finance school after the first six weeks of basic, and then be an accountant of some sort for the rest of my time. And I so hated accounting. That was my major in college, like a dumbo, you know. Um, 
And I just, I'm not going to do that. I just don't want to sit behind a desk for that time and do the kind of work that I had experienced just before I was drafted. And so um, I got the opportunity. I tried three different outfits. That, uh, at Fort Sheridan, they had offices set up in little rooms like this, for example, that were talk to guys and let them know, well, and uh, when I got, got to this one, uh, it was a CIC, Counterintelligence Corps, which they described as the Army's version of the FBI. Well, here I'm 22 years of age. A great romantic. I loved the FBI. Every movie they had, anything I could read about them, I would do so. So I jumped on it, okay? And... I went to the school then, and after the first six weeks of basic training, they transferred me to the um, 14-week cycle, so I had eight more to go. And this was infantry basic training. And there had been a lot of guys who had gone to different of these, these um, made application to these different outfits, and we were all in there together. I mean, it, big bunch of us. Mm -hmm. And so it was like starting it for, um, over from scratch because they were telling us um, the big thing is that now you're in the infantry and you're a fighting man and who knows where you're going to go or what the circumstances are, gonna, are going to be but the Korean War was really moving along now mm -hmm. of course and um, he said, you will, the first thing you will do personally, you will find one of the guys of this bunch of 200 and some fellows, you will find a, a person that you will love more than your own brother because he will be more important to you. You will rely on him for your life and he will certainly rely on you for the same thing if you're in the front lines and oftentimes that happens, okay? So, turned out I got three others. There were four of us. And it was a real cute thing. What they had for us in basic training, we got our yearbook. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I still have it to this date. And in that yearbook, at the very end of it, uh, it was kind of uh, unique because it at Fort Riley, Kansas. Camp Funston was where we did basic training. And while we were there, we had an extra three weeks of bivouac because whatever the river was that fl uh, flooded, it uh, kicked us out of the basic, uh, out of our normal area. Uh, and we ended up... Oh, my goodness. ...in the bivouac area for, for three, well, for those three weeks. And we had already done our regular bivouac, so I had five weeks of bivouac, you know, and when I was in the arm, in a pup tent, you know. So it was really, that was kind of cool. And this book was great, I kept it. With great remembrances, but the saddest one is my number one choice for my uh, uh, Foxwell buddy. And here's a guy right next to me, down in the, the lower corner there. So you are... Bill Wainick. There is Phil, and then Bill yeah. Wainick, okay. Yep. And he went directly from a 14-week cycle, took some leave time, went you know, then went over to Korea, and by the time I was getting out of the, out of the, the school at Fort Holabird, the counterintelligence corps school, he was dead. His whole squad was knocked out. Mm -hmm. It's amazing how quickly I got over that, though, because going in myself and no. Things happen, you know. It wasn't until I really um, f 
50 years after being getting out of the service, when we started to have our reunions, mm -hmm. and this was the CIC guys, the guys in basic, after that I, I didn't see any of them. I finished school, I had the GI Bill, I went to law school, I had a family, and one of the, to me, one of the significant things too about how the, the um, what would we call it, the luck of the draw. Uh, I was assigned to Germany and went over there, and the first thing we did, we had a, a six weeks Berlitz course. And there were about 15 of us in the course. And the very first day, the CEO came up and he said, gentlemen, we're, we are expanding. We're, we would like to get more uh, women in the typing pool who are, are married to, uh, guy, to agents. Mm -hmm. And they asked us, and I said, yeah, that's what my wife did. They gave me an application. I mailed it home to her. And I said, complete the application very carefully, but complete it. And um, if everything works out OK, you can come over here <laughs> and Bad Vilmanen and work in the typing pool. And the typing pool was right next to the agents' uh, rooms, very similar to this, where we would have to type up our reports when we got off, uh, off the uh, back in from. I worked up in the British zone all the time. I was there from Monday to usually Friday, and uh, so it, that's what it turned out to be. She came over there on May first of 1952, and I remember it very well because May, May 1st is what they call May Day throughout the world, and this is when the communists celebrate universally, okay? And so being, in the, being a spy, you know, they said, use the back rows, and they told me how to get to Frankfurt to pick her up. And, and so I, <clears throat> that's what I did, I brought her over. And she was with us over there exactly eight months because by the end of eight months, she was seven months pregnant. <laughs> and you can't, you can't fly after the seventh month. And it would have been kind of inordinate, for example, for me to have to wave goodbye to her and come home and receive her when she came home after, with a baby, you know. Right. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, but let's say I found very, uh, really cute about the whole thing. By the time I got back to the States um, and was rotated out, it was March, 20, March 21st, and she had had the baby on Friday the 13th, and the day she was getting out of the uh, excuse me, <coughs> uh, the day I was getting out and got home, there she's being brought home with my darling, beautiful uh, daughter Susan. And it was kind of a nice homecoming, you know. I, I meet my daughter for the first time, you know. So anyway, that's, that was the culmination of my time. Mm -hmm. It could not have been better. Mm -hmm. But so many significant things occurred when I was over there. And I've just taken a, uh, some notes about the various events that happened, one of which was I've always I've never liked guns, and even when I practiced law, uh, every time I would represent a, a person on a possession case with a gun, I'd say, well, okay, if you want me to represent you, sign this C and D order. What's that? He said, that means, I said, you'll never see that gun again. Uh, you're, 
it's going to be confiscated. Well, I like the guy. And they said, not if you want me to represent you. And they never lost a client that way, but they all lost a gun. Mm -hmm. I've never owned a gun in my life. But when I was in this CIC, my weapon of issuance was a snub nose 38 with the holster. And that's all I had to, this really cute little thing, you know. And I kept thinking to myself, I'll be very careful. Every used to take it up into the British zone with me. I said, for what? I'm gonna, what am I going to do? Am I going to shoot uh, shoot it out with a tank, for example? No, I might shoot it. I might blow a toe off me, you know. No. So, anyway, <laughs> one of the guys, and I don't really know who it was, they rang the bell on me. And Schellenberger, the captain in charge of it, says, you're goofy, you know. <laughs> what do you mean I'm goofy? I got to know him pretty well. He used to complain that, well, you know, you, <clears throat> you're lucky. All you NCOs, and I was a PFC, a big NCO that is, right? <laughs> and uh, he said, I've heard a lot about the fun you guys have there, and the officers are so boring. <laughs> you know, I said, Take your uniform off, come and join us, have a good time. <laughs> But he was, a neat, he was a neat guy. But uh, anyway, that was kind of the thing that, oh, I found, I know how to follow instructions. So they taught me how to use that thing. And I've got my little record somewhere here where in my class of about 60, there were four who, uh, shot expert and I was one of the four. The list is here. Well, they, they don't have to see it. Trust me when I tell you that's what it was. Okay. One of the neat things to... Uh, <laughs> I've had nothing but fun with this also. Um, when I was over there before Olga, my wife, got there, on the 1st of May, um, I was staying in a room with a guy by the name of Ike Hagen, who was from, can't remember now, haven't seen him since we were over there, but um, Ike Hagen and I established a really close friendship, and we really used to know how to drink the last day of each month, um, the bar, the bartender guys, they would have a free loan brow night. Okay, so we would drink, drink our loan brow, even when my wife got there on that last, uh, last Friday of the month, we, I would say, honey, uh, I can, I used to play Ping pong all the time was really quite good. And I was just that much better than him, you know. But it was a, a good time, and one of the big things he remembers so well, and it happened every month, he says, You know, we get up in bed here, you know, and, and, and our little cots, and where we were was an absolute fire hazard. If something, that place went up, we were gone immediately. To jump out the window was about like the fourth floor level uh, in this uh, place where we did all of our uh, celebrating and all the parties that we had were right in, in there. And um, it was just, it was kind of dangerous, but we would be there and uh, still talk, able to talk. We never got so drunk we couldn't walk up the stairs. But sometimes you would get so bad. He says, Phil, I'm afraid to even move my toes. <laughs> you know, he, he says, I know I'm, I'm going to toss my cookies. I said, well, then shut up and go, go to sleep. You know? But uh, he was a character, real character. And, but the, uh, the big thing, when we were... St after I got my assignment to go over to 
uh, to Germany, I, I got to some uh, somewhere in, in, in New Jersey. We were being shipped out of New Jersey, and the last day there, we were only there, only there for a couple. I just did nothing. You know, I was walking around. Uh, it was winter, you know, and uh, everyone had a place to go. And I'm thinking, I had my credentials with me, which I was so proud of them. You know, I, I can't tell you. And the shield that went along with them, and the little uh, packet case. And so um, I had them, and they said, You'll watch these very carefully because if you lose them, you will be courts martialed for sure, and you'll you'll do time at Fort Leavenworth to let you know mm -hmm. this is really serious mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. They get in the hands of the wrong person, mm -hmm. and it's going to be it's serious. Okay, so I never had a problem when uh, on the way across. If I took a shower, I give them to the this one buddy I had, and so. He'd hold it for me, and as soon as I get out, I'd, I would take him back, and that was it, you know. And so you watch him very, very carefully. But uh, I was thinking, I must really be something to be in this outfit. I read them over, and the dumbest thing, I never copied them down. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get the guys from our, our bunch who are still alive, and to see if anyone possibly did it. I, I didn't get far enough into uh, the records of the, uh, the CIC to find out if there might be a place where I could get them because the wording was such that, and they told us in class, you have enough power where if you wanted to, without any authorization from anyone, you could go on any army post and walk down, get inside the entrance there and tell them, okay, lock that door, show them your credentials and say, I'm on a special mission and which you're not entitled to any information on and close off everything. Mm -hmm. And he says, he says, you'd get away with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, but, that would be it. You'd be back at Leavenworth, you know, dishonorable discharge. You have to pay for the cost of whatever it did that was created by your doing such a thing. So you had the power, but you could not abuse it. No, you would you, be punished no, if you were, yes. Yeah, that was it, yeah, exactly. But, uh, so here I am in New York with this power, and I'm thinking, and I'm looking at all these peons around here. I wonder how many CIC agents are. There could be, you know, and so a sergeant came up to me. He says, I've been watching you for a couple hours, and you haven't done anything. Give me your dog tags. So he gave me the dog tag. I gave my dog tags. He didn't ask for the credentials. I just had my PFC stripe on, you know. And he says, all right, um, what you do? Follow me. So we went, and we went to um, the furnace room of one of the buildings. And at that time, this you know this is back in 1952. Um, they were all fed by uh, coke or uh, just coal, mm -hmm. and they had a big, big, long hole in his head. It's the heaviest thing I ever saw in my life to take the clinkers out of there at the end of the day so it would function properly. Mm -hmm. It had just snowed that morning and he gave me that. <laughs> he said, you go and you shovel, <laughs> shovel out from uh, the sidewalk out there, you know. And he says, I'm going to be watching you closely. And I said, if you mess around at all, you are in trouble. I don't care where you're going, what the circumstances are. 
but you are in big trouble. And talk about humility setting in quickly and stupidity, you know? And so I think from that point on, I, I, the rest of my life, I still remember it like it was yesterday, you know? And I was so angry at you know? Well, first off, unfortunately, he was looking, but I still think it was a, a good, good lesson. Mm -hmm. So what happens, I think um, that was probably the best thing that I learned initially. Um, and then little things like dog tags again, you know, I would make them available if they were requested of me. But when I got on the USS El Tinge and took 11 days to get across the ocean, I'm saying to myself, there were 3,500 of us on this little scow. It was less, just about 500 feet long, 511 mm. something. I mean, it was small. They had the patch and they had the rows and these were, uh, 790, 800 feet, you know, and uh, not us. <laughs> and this was March, okay? Stormy weather. We had rough water all the way across, all the way across. 97% seasickness. I was one of the 3% who didn't get seasick. But I remember going down into to the um, washroom for the guys, you know. They'd have a little train that would go from well, that firewall over there all the way down to this wall here. And, you know, just for urination and so <laughs> This thing was loaded with vomit. The stairwells, when you walked out of there, to go upstairs, sloshing the junk was that deep in there, and I'm saying to myself, someone is going to have to clean this up. And it ain't going to be any of the merchant mariners, it's going to be us little old dough boys. And I ain't going to be one of them, because I would get sick. So when I get up in the morning, I had a little alarm clock that I brought along. I set it for 3 o'clock in the morning. And I would get up and I would go on deck and there'd be no one on deck. But there were these exhaust kind of fans that there, there, they were like an inverted U, you know. And so I went and I would sit under those things. It'd take a little while to get accustomed, you know, to this stench yet, if you will. But after that, you know, it was nice warm air coming in and I had my big trench coat and I had a tanker jacket on and I would sit out there all day long and I made friends with a couple of guys and there's enough space for two people there so they could always come and get it and then I could relieve myself or go eat or whatever you know and so I did that all the way across and all the way back <laughs> Roy Neely my buddy from our from our outfit but that was kind of kind of cool. And one time, yeah, these uh, army guys are not stupid, you know. If you get a, get a detail and you need guys, where are you going to go to get them? You're going to go somewhere where there's a line. And there was always a line that, near the PX, you know, that they had on board there. So they pick guys out from there. Hey. Stand here. Hey, and I, hey, you, stand, come on over here. I got a detail for you. They'd always say, give me your dog tags. I said, they're in my duffel bag, you know. So as soon as the guy, <laughs> it happened a number of times, as soon as the guy would, you know, with, you got 3,500 guys there. How many sergeants looking for details? They can't remember anyone, okay? So as soon as they turn their head, zoom, I walk away. And I never got stuck. And maybe that's why I made a pretty good lawyer. <laughs> you know? But that was something else. Um, so that's what I learned about the dog tags. And then 
when we got to Germany, we um, debarked from the El the Eltinge in Sonhofen. And in Sonhofen, this is, there's a concern there. It was a for the German youth mm -hmm. at the time when the war is going on for training in the whole bit. Really nice place. And we were stuck there for three days. We had beer there, but everyone wanted to get in to, into the town. And from the time, like maybe four o'clock or right after dinner, you could take the bus all the way down um, to Sonhofen and all kinds of drinking establishments there. Well, our first day out, we did that. And I don't know how, you, you always make friends in the service, you know, you're there. And, uh, so I picked up another guy and we went down to San Jose and I'm uh, on the bus. We found out what time does the bus, uh, when's the last bus? And they say, oh, one o'clock in the morning at 12 or whatever the time was. It's okay. Well, we missed it. This one day, and we had started drinking, and I loved German beer, always have, and I drank so much of it I got bloated on it. So I had to switch. I went from German beer to um, a white wine, and I've had probably a half a dozen um, glasses of white wine. And then I went from there, I got bloated on it, back to beer again, you know? And so by, by this time, the bus has gone upstairs. So it turns out that we walked all the way up. And, you know, I don't know, maybe we ate a little something, but I had all this stuff, and of course, my bladder was complained, so I accommodated it, you know. And so the next morning, and this is a story that when Mary and I went back years later mm -hmm. to, for me to, to retrace my steps, I went into the same concern, and they wouldn't let people on. But I told the guys, I told them the story I'm about to tell you. He said, no, you got to get in here and go over there. So we, I couldn't find a picture of me standing there laughing like crazy when I was alone. Um, but they had us <coughs> fall in in front and it, uh, uh, a line four deep and it had to be two blocks long. Was this the next morning? This was the next morning, mm -hmm. yeah. And this is before I still had, I had a fair amount of gas, okay. And so it was a perfect manning for what I'm about to tell you. No wind, no nothing. <laughs> I, I let loose with the greatest, with the greatest, um, sneaky eruption that I've ever had in my life. And it just seemed to hover around there, but it was so bad, the guys were <laughs> saying, who farted, who farted, you know? And, and they broke ranks. I, I, there wasn't anyone within 15 or 20 feet of me. <laughs> The guy who was, fall in, fall in, he's yelling. <laughs> and the guy's using regular no, uh, army kind of language. The F word came out again. <laughs> and the guy wouldn't, would not <laughs> fall in. You know? So finally, it was finally dissipated. Yeah. And I was a guilty one. I couldn't stop laughing. And some of the guys started then to, you know, he said, that was perfect. A little, a little bit of levity, huh? <laughs> that was, I'm going to, have, I'm going to make the best of my service. Right, okay? and that was probably the best. Um, so we've uh, all good gets there, and 
This is your first wife? Yeah, it was my first wife. Uh -huh. So Olga um, starts working, and what they did, they gave her an apartment in the Furstenhof Hotel. There were three big hotels in town. I don't have a, didn't bring a picture of the Bada, which was the biggest one. But then we had the Furstenhof, which was ours, and we had a room up on the third floor with a beautiful view. And I think I was just... Oh, that's beautiful. That's the hotel. That's beautiful. Show you the Furstenhof. And it is extraordinary. So as soon as her clearance came through, I had top secret security clearance. She had to have confidential. It came through a couple of weeks later. And in the meantime, this one lieutenant and his wife had offered our place to them. They had a spare bedroom while well, they were going to be in town. And they, were, they left in two weeks. And then Gordy... Rice, uh, the cook for the NCO guys, uh, they had a room there too, and we stayed there until her uh, clearance did come through, which was almost a month. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then they gave her that apartment, and so we went from living with someone else into our own posh place. <laughs> And here I am, a PFC, okay? And, uh, you know, it doesn't, as I tell everyone, the roll of the dice. Mm -hmm. I was just very, very, very fortunate. Mm -hmm. and then, as soon as uh, the, we finished the Berlitz course, I started working, and I remember on my very first trip up north, into the British zone. I worked exclusively in the British zone for the uh, almost a year that I was on active uh, active service. And uh, Arlson, A R O L S E N. And Arlson was now this is you know, 53, eight years after the end of the war. Mm -hmm. And I found out that they had accumulated all of the records that they put together in Europe into this place in Arlson. And that was probably my toughest day that I was in the service, except the time when I got lost behind the Iron Curtain. Um, but on this particular occasion, I went to Arlson I had the names of four or five different people who had made application to come and work for the army. These were displaced persons, and you wanted to, you had to check everyone out because we didn't want to get any communists. We didn't want any people with a bad record. So I'd always have to check with Arlson first, and every town where the people live, we have to check the criminal report reports on uh, records there to see if they have any record. Are these uh, local people or are no, they? No, these uh, were people who at one point had stayed somewhere in Germany where all these records were being accumulated. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they would be there and it wouldn't necessarily be from the Arlson area, it could be um, from Hamburg, for example, or Hildesheim. I spent a lot of time in Hildesheim, and it was okay. Um, so I remember going down there with these four names, and I was there for about two and a half or three hours, checking all of them, just those three or four to find the records, to make doubly sure you had the right person. But, you know, date of birth, of course, uh, would, would obviously help, and some of them may have given the wrong date of birth. You, know, you never know. And, um, when these uh, regular records were accumulated... Uh, but are these, you know, are these Americans you're talking about? or are no, these, these, these are... are... These were displaced persons, these were Jews, anyone, oh, okay. anyone okay. at all. Okay. Right? And so, 
I would go through sometimes what's a common name. I may have to go through 50 pages to find the right name. But in doing that, you would come across the docket book was a regular size docket book. You would open it up and it would be about um, this wide all together and one line would be that one person from one the entire history was there and I'd sometimes go 20, 30, 40 pages and there would be red lines for, for every single name on the page. And there was a person who died at one of these places. And by the time I got out of there, I, I broke down. I, I couldn't drive for an hour. I'm just thinking, all oh, these dead people, all of them, and all because of the mad, a mad world. Mm -hmm. yeah. Were these concentration camp uh, victims or just... No, they, wherever they would be, you know. Okay. But if they if they had gotten out, you know, this is eight years later now. Okay. And so maybe they had been in Dachau, or um, I was going to say in China, <laughs> but um, at any one of those, they were they were all over Germany. Of so it was just the, the 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 extreme killing that had gone on. And yeah, that's right. I mean, just recognizing that. We heard about these concentration camps, and mm -hmm. nothing more vivid in my mind was yeah. So that was my record, my result of of uh, Arlson, and I hated going there because every time, the first time it was so bad, I it really broke me up. So those yeah. records were um, was that a place where Germany had elected to send the records? Well, that's. Yeah, that's, uh, or maybe they had done it. Sorry to bother you. I want to give you this. You probably recognize the picture. Oh, great. Okay, <laughs> it's an old postcard. Thank you very much. You're it's welcome. A, oh, sorry. <laughs> that's Harry Truman's way. If, if you have a lot of time, I could tell you what I'm doing with this, um, Harry Truman and his uh, library and museum. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so that was really, really something. So, so these were records that Germany had collected to put to, at this one spot? Well, no, they didn't collect them at their one spot. These were records from all over the country, from okay. every army post and every one of the, uh, uh, the Dachau's out there. Mm -hmm. And then the United <coughs> Nations, it took the one who put this together. It's the International Tracing Service. And it was just something that I'll never forget in the early years. Mm -hmm. You know, and almost as bad as just what happened to my buddy. But anyway, that was the one. So I go down and I'm, I'm, the town of Giessen was something where I came across, I, I had the highest regard for the Army, I think as a result of the training that I had had up until that time. Mm -hmm. John Crump was a sergeant and he was working um, in positive intelligence. Mm -hmm. And one of the people he was working with, um, he had met with him a number of times and got all this positive intelligence and gave him money for it. And on this occasion, he says, Phil, I've got a conflict. Would you mind meeting with him uh, in, in Giessen? And I said, okay, tell me where and what. And so he gave me the 25,000 Deutschmarks. And um, he says, you'll have, you know, he'll have a packet for you. And yeah, that's fine. Okay, so I met with the guy. He gave him, he gave me the packet, I gave him the money, and he said, would you mind driving me to the, the um, 
a train station in the center of town. I said, fine. So it's in one of those roundabouts. They're going to, mm -hmm. oh, it's a wagon wheel. It had to be eight or ten different roads coming into it and then going out. And <clears throat> so I'm approaching the, the uh, train station's spot right there, and I'm looking, and here's this pipe. And it was about that. Well, horizontally, there were two of them, and they went all the way around, you know, and they were interrupted, of course, by the roads coming into it. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And so I know I had to drop them off. So I get to that the spot where he wanted off, and he opens the door, and just at that moment I realize what it was. That pipe separated the bicycle track from the walkway. Okay? <laughs> he opens the door, and a, a guy, he had to be 30 if he was a day, plows into the door. And Boom! <laughs> you know? He goes up over the door, that guy, uh, and he turns over and he's on his back. And he's got his, the fear of death look on his, on his face, you know. <laughs> Already I'm thinking this, this is a little funny, you know. Well, that's not funny. He broke his arm. And uh, this guy looked at me, you know, like, this guy is... Uh, Everyone is looking for him. He's a spy, and mm -hmm. they want to. They would want to get get him. Our opponents. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they said, "What do I do?" I said, "Get out of here." So he left, left, and that was it. Never saw him again. And I wait there, and this is not long before the cops came came by, and they started their investigation. I gave them my. I uh, my <clears throat> my credentials, and then I said, "You you speak English?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "Read that closely." And um, I'm a special agent for this outfit, mm -hmm. and I said, <laughs> "I'll give you the information that I that I will." And nothing further. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the person who opened the door? What person? Yeah, it's none of your business. I said, well, I got to have it. No, you don't got to have it. I am telling you that you're not going to get it. And if you want to take me to, into your chief, I'll talk to him. I hope he speaks English. If not, I'll speak my fractured German, you know. And he says, okay. That's all. I gave him all the information. I was served with the summons and the complaint. Uh, maybe three, four months later, they're suing me for 25,000 Deutschmarks and turned it in, and that's it. But it was just the idea, you know. We were a very sub-rosa kind of an outfit, mm -hmm. and you got to know what to do. And here I'm, I, by this time I'm 22, and I'm saying to myself, you know, they trained me well, and I learned. I didn't have one second's trepidation. You, know? you just did what you had to do. I just did what I had to do, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't <clears> fought <throat> any of them, you know. And I said, that was okay, that was okay. <laughs> but it was, it was really funny. You had to see his face as he's floating through the air. You know. And then it wasn't on that trip, but there was another one. When I was headed, I had done some work in Giessen and was going out of town. And as I this, there was this one road that I was on, and that road went straight ahead. But it also went off to the to the left, and I was going to go to the left, and it was kind of a downhill thing, and all that happened took place in front of me, you know, and so here's a guy on a bicycle who was on the road, and they had the same ride as we did, and so 
he's going, he wants to go that way. And here's a guy coming this way, and he wants to, uh, to go, uh, pass me off. Uh, no, and they uh, go on the other side and go in that direction. So they're coming towards one another, and this guy, he's moves to the right, and this guy moves to the left. Zoom, 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 and they go by. And I said to myself, <coughs> that's one of the reasons they lost the war, <laughs> because they just didn't think. Yeah. You know? And everyone says that the American uh, citizen soldier, there's none better, because among other things, he wants to live. Mm -hmm. And he thinks of how he's going to be able mm -hmm. to live, irrespective of the circumstances. It's an interesting observation you made. That's right. It's it, was, it was just it's just the way we are, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And so I, I thought that was a good example. And the third thing in Kieson, um I was up there, I guess, for a couple of weeks this one time. Uh, oh, oh, this was before um, Olga started working there. So she said, well, I said, why don't you come with me? I don't know. I was like, come along. We'll, we'll make room, of course. So we get there, and this guy is uh, um, Carl something or other, and he spoke perfect English. He had written a book about on Shakespeare, and he had a son. His wife had died. He had this son who was about seven or eight. And Olga and he really hit it off. Well, I was working, you know, and the kids, uh, kids really like, always did like Olga. And so it turned out that someone said something, and there was something that would, you know, everyone was laughing at. And then Fati, the little boy, says to his, uh, to his father in German, are they laughing in German or in English? <laughs> you know, and the place went up for grabs. Yeah. Okay, and it was it was just this is the, the little niceties mm -hmm. that are really made the trip so mm -hmm. well worthwhile. Mm -hmm. The next one's kind of funny. I had to uh, conduct an investigation uh, at a, a French concern in Fritzlar. And I remember driving in, it was all spick and span, you know, a really nice place. I pulled up in the parking lot, and there was a, right in front of a window. And it was the window where the chief of police, chief of police, the uh, commander of this particular spot, uh, that was his office there. So he turns around and looks, and he sees a license plate on the car. And they said, oh, so it's an American one. So he immediately got up and walked um, through the main entrance where I had to walk, maybe a quarter of a block down. So I go in there and he's waiting for me there. He's a bird colonel. And as soon as I knew he was a bird colonel, I started smiling and I couldn't stop all the time I was there. He broke out a bottle of wine. It was there maybe an hour and a quarter. We had to get a, two different interpreters to go from from uh, English to French to German, and then back the same way. You know, so we needed we needed two of them anyway. <laughs> All the time, I got this look on my face. So, what is a bird colonel? Pardon? What is that? What type of of, of colonel is that? Well, it was a bird, like our bird colonel, you know, in the uh, in the French army. Okay, okay. And yeah, so it was just a concern that every once in a while you would find them around. And I think they made some special arrangements because there weren't too many people you couldn't know because you weren't around at the time. But not too many people thought very highly of the French for backing out of the war the way they did. Mm -hmm. And then when it's all over, de Gaulle comes on. And so he was one of the main uh, military men 
and that he did something good. He did something lousy. He saved Paris, no question, he saved Paris. But in the process, he probably um, Everyone else fought to the death, but not the French. He had to save their, save, uh, save uh, all of France, and they, of course that included Paris. Mm -hmm. And it was just one of those things that everyone were disdainful of him, but they were on the edge of going communist, and mm -hmm. so everyone had to be cute with them, like they. Uh, I keep thinking of. Um, Montgomery, the, the kid, military man of the British, and MacArthur, the three of them, to me, they should all be shot at sunrise. But anyway, so then this look on the face, it was, kind of, it was really one of the funnest things that I could have gone through. If he only knew I was a PFC. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, are we are we about running out of time? Yeah, if you want, if you have anything further that you'd like to say, any. Um... Okay, well, I tell you what, it was such a magnificent experience for mm -hmm. me because, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes by virtue of our mental attitude, things happen, mm -hmm. whether. You know, we, we don't design them, but I went in and I, everything I saw was an exciting challenge. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm the proudest American soldier you ever came across. I wouldn't even tell a lot of my buddies, even at the CIC school. You'd think there'd be a lot of... Uh, Daniel Moynihan, who was a, a uh, senator mm -hmm. from somewhere in the East, he was in our class. I didn't know him at all. But let me tell you... Uh, I just loved everything military, mm -hmm. and yeah, I was so proud to, to be drafted, and I would never have signed up. I have a worry ward of a mother, and I can tell you a couple of stories where my dad had to intercede a couple of times where I did things that I shouldn't have done, you know, taking flying lessons when my, my kids were between the ages. Well, the, the boys were three, four, and five, and my daughter was seven. You know, he says, you, the way he brought it up to me, he said, you know, you're killing your mother. Dad, what are you talking about? <laughs> he says, and he says, every time she hears about, uh, I said, you and your, your big mouth, if, it, if you'd kept quiet, it might have been okay. But she just knew that uh, every plane in the sky, uh, let's say if something happened, it was going to happen to you next. You know? Yeah. So I quit the lessons. And that, it was right. It was just dumb. I was making enough money to do it, and I've always wanted to fly. But the responsibility of raising four kids right. is much more important. Right, right. Well, as I say, it, it was just such a tremendous experience. Well, that's that's wonderful. It's good to hear. Well, we all appreciate what you've done. Well, and it's, it's, as I see, I'm almost apologetic about it because it couldn't have been any better. Right. I could not have planned anything as right. well as the Lord worked out for mm -hmm. me. You know? Well, as, as, as doing these interviews, the stories are all so different. Pardon? The stories are all very different from all of the veterans, all the stories that, oh, that we that's hear. Right, right. And um, in your story is your story, and, and we enjoy hearing it. You've got a lot of funny stories. So. I do. Oh, I have more. <laughs> I really do. Sometime, we're going to go out to lunch sometime, okay? <laughs> I promise you that. And it remind me to tell you about Hamburg. That's a dan, dan, dandy. And then the Ader Zay, where Roy Neely, who just died less than a year ago. <laughs> oh, and the diet. I think, this is, you know, one of the reasons we won the war is, as handily as we did. Every American, I had mentioned it earlier, every American is a thinking man. They don't particularly like where, where they are as a result, but 
they're there, they, they're proud of their country, and they want to survive, and they'll do anything to survive within the rules and, and regulations of, of our military. And um, any guy, you, you never know. A guy like Sergeant York is a classic example in World War I. If you, I don't know if you've ever, ever watched that movie, but it's outstanding. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a classic example, a strongly religious human being who he did it because, number one, he killed because these guys were killing us. You know? But it's just, it's just, I'm very proud of our country. What's happening to it now leaves me in a, in a very distressful state. Mm -hmm. And I want to do whatever I can. My arrangements, I, th I think I told you I was going in to go down to uh, uh, <coughs> our place. Here you know, the uh, Truman. Mm -hmm. Have you ever been there? No, I've not. You gotta go. You really do. It'll make you feel so, so much, much better that you are an American and recognize that there was a man above politics mm -hmm. who was in the office who did whatever was right. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he did it all his life. I have over 70 books on it. And I'm just, I consider him one of my mentors. I really mm -hmm, and truly mm -hmm, do. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, I've been talking to the later, the lady, uh, Kim Hauser, I guess it is, uh, to see if I can't talk them into putting together uh, outside of uh, independence right. at the museum, something we could do here the same way mm -hmm. that he's teaching kids about the value of the presidency, mm -hmm. but even more so, uh, being an American. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, you have an interesting story, um, Phil. It's, it's wonderful, and it's, I've enjoyed listening to your many stories, and um, I know that uh, they'll be enjoyed by many who will be able to have access to the, the Illinois project here, the yeah. oral project. So, well, I thank you very much, and yeah, it's been a great listening. And um, uh, that concludes our interview for today. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And okay. Thank you. So, when you finish your school, when you say you've got... You'll be finished in May? Um, I'm done in May. Yeah, let me get this done. We'll have to talk then.